Hi everyone, welcome back to this coronavirus lockdown interview series that we're doing today. I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Lauren Jane Bowyer, a Foundation 2 doctor working in the Nottingham area, who is a graduate entry medicine graduate now, so working as an F2 doctor, second year of practice, and also navigated med school successfully and life as a junior doctor while also being a mum. Hi Lauren, it's good to have you on. Hi Ollie, thank you for having me. Um, so I guess just for the boys and girls at home, could you quickly just run us through who you are? What do you do day to day? So I'm currently in F2, as you said, um, I've just finished a geriatrics rotation. Um, so that kind of, uh, is, is quite a specialist role. Actually it's working in ED, um, and it's trying to discharge patients who don't necessarily need to be there. It's quite a specialist role for an F2, actually, um, a lot of, foundation work is things like uh, taking bloods, doing discharge summaries, um, all of that routine kind of ward work. Um, actually, my F2 year has not really been like that at all. So day to day, I'm more clerking patients in ED and then discharging them home, um, which is quite a responsibility, actually, to send someone away from the hospital and into the community. Sure. Um, so that's what I do day to day. Excellent. So again, um, I'm just running theme of this series, um, mostly watched by people thinking about coming to medical school and becoming doctors or medical students who may shortly become doctors. A lot of people are interested in how foundation jobs actually work. Um, see, it used to be different a while ago when people heard about house jobs and so on. So would you mind just taking us very quickly about how um, during your F1 and F2, how you're how your jobs actually work jobs in the sense of kind of the, the day-to-day work or um move rotating yeah like or... the different placements you might do okay so when you uh, when you're at medical school you apply for a foundation block so you can't cherry pick necessarily all six of those jobs what you might do is you might say, so for me, I really wanted to do cardiac surgery and I really wanted to do obs and gynae. So of those six jobs, I was able to find a couple of blocks where it had those two jobs and then everything else is just what you get. Um, some of those will be community placements and they will work differently than your hospital placements. Um, you usually, you will have at least one community placement um, I've had two or should have had two. Um, and then the day-to-day -day life will be largely the same for the most part, unless you've got some really specialist jobs. So when you apply, you will rank what jobs you want all the way down to the bottom. There'll be about 80 of them. And then based on your medical school scores and your SJT scores, you'll be allocated wherever in the kind of ranking you get put. Sure. I was lucky enough to get my um, my first choice job, which hey. was really nice because because I am a parent, um, I wanted to location was the most important thing for me. So most people will take a job at a t big teaching hospital, and then they will have a job in a in a district general, which may be an hour away, an hour and a half away. So most people will have to you know move or commute during that kind of that part portion of the rotation um there are always a couple of jobs that are stuck with both the kind of big teaching hospital jobs but they're very very competitive and difficult to get but because of my caring responsibilities um it was really important for me to try and snag one of those sure um so i worked really really hard at med school to try and make sure that that was the case um, and i was able to get one which was really fantastic so I would urge anyone who's sort of in a similar position to me to think about um, strategically ranking those jobs and think about location and then your choice of placement can be secondary. So that's how we kind of choose our placements. Yeah. In terms of how it works, so the administration of the foundation program is probably what we all find the most stressful. So depending on where you are, will depend on how effectively you get notified as to where you're going to be. Um, so you will usually get contacted six weeks before with the rotor. Um, now, as a foundation doctor, 
um, you all, as all doctors, we are working a 40 hour average um, in terms of our hours, but it can be anything up to about 72 hours. Um, yeah. I have to say in my foundation program, I very rarely worked 72 hour placements, but there have been a couple of weeks where I've done sort of 72, 72, 72. And it's, it's a lot. It's yes. really a lot, especially, especially for me. Um, it's, it's a lot. Um, so you will be allocated to a kind of whichever job you have. The majority of jobs, or in fact, both of my um, F1 placements, which were cardiac surgery and hematology, worked very similar in terms of what I was expected to do. Mm -hmm. So rotate six weeks before, night shifts, which are usually in my trust, um, you would do a Friday, a Saturday and a Sunday, have the Monday off because obviously you work to Monday morning, have the Tuesday off and then back on the wards Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or you would do Monday through to Friday as night shifts, 12 hour shifts, and then you'd be off the weekend. And that's standard depending on whether you're on medicine or surgery. Um, hours will vary depending on where you are. So I, for me, surgery was, was better for my life because you would start at 7.30 in the morning and you would finish at five. But because you're doing more hours week to week, you would have less time to kind of do on calls. Sure. Whereas on medicine, you would do sort of nine to five and then they've got loads of hours spare for, to say, actually you're working till 10 tonight right. and again and again and again. Um, so mostly things will work similar in terms of hours, but there are some variations. In terms of the actual day-to-day -day work, so ward round first thing. Yep. Um, my top tips for, for doing ward round is make sure you know your patients. That's the way to impress your consultants. So. At the end of every day, I would always make sure all of the x-ray reports that they had requested, you know, on that day were written in the notes, all of the blood results in the notes, echo reports in the notes. And then when they come to ward round in the morning, they it's want to know how's my echo and you know, and you can tell them and it speeds ward round up and it makes you look really efficient and really, really good at your job. And I did really well on cardiac surgery because I did that. So that would be my top tip for ward round. You can use that wherever. Yeah. Um, what else do I need to tell you? So surgical ward round, very quick. Medical <laughs> ward round, you probably know, much lower. Yeah, I am. I'm experience. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big fan of surgical ward round. It's like CT scan, <laughs> blood C discharge. Boom. C medics. <laughs> yeah, C, yeah, C medics. Um, I really like that. Um, but same, same kind of applies to medicine. Um, the rest of my day, so ward round would give me a load of jobs. So it can be tricky if you're the only doctor on the ward. So you're going to need to scribe in the notes and you're also going to need to make your jobs list. So it helps to make sure you've written all the beds down, things like that. Be really on top of your jobs. Like I would never miss a job, always try and anticipate what that patient will need if you can do it beforehand. Yeah. And then I would spend the majority of the day doing those ward jobs. Um, on cardiac surgery and hematology, that would be mostly on my own. And sometimes they can be busy, busy days if you're on your own, because if ward round doesn't finish until 11 and then you've got 20 million jobs to do, and those jobs would range from things like taking bloods, mm -hmm. um, ordering scans, uh, it might be reviewing a patient, but as an F1, that's a bit less likely. I did find that because sometimes when there was my F2 and, and myself as the F1, he would take a lead on the more clinical stuff and I would do more of the TTO kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, I would always have an order for how I would tackle my jobs. So blood's always first because they need to go off to the lab. So you want to get those back. Scans sure. always ordered first if possible. Um, and just to have a really good system as to, to what you're doing and when. So you can get all of that information back so the consultants can move their patient forward. The things that would invariably interrupt that would be um, patients becoming unwell. So you'll be all on top of your jobs. You're just about to go for lunch and then someone gets really sick 
um, and they will need to be clerked or someone has a fall and then you have to do the whole fall stuff. Sure. Um, so that would be part of the job as well. Um, that would be the main bread and butter really yeah. of the job as a foundation doctor. The only other thing is, is, is discharge summaries, mm -hmm. which are the bane of every junior doctor's life. Because, you know, kind of as I told you, there's an order to how we tend to do things. You want things that are going to go off and, you know, need four hours to process to be done first. Yeah. Whereas with a discharge summary, it's at the bottom of your priority list because of it's not, there's no clinical need really. Yeah. Um, and you spend a lot of time on the wards actually being chased for, you know, ten, have you done these 10 TTOs? And you think, well, actually, I've got a patient who's scoring an eight over here. So I'm going to do yeah. this first. And then actually, I know this person's at four now, but they're going to need to be seen as well. Um, so they would also need to be fit in. Yeah. We also have teaching once a week, which you must go to. It's protected time. And you must always, always, always take your breaks. It's a skill in itself. Uh, it's a skill. <laughs> amazing so let's just talk a bit about about navigating med school and life as a junior um as a mum so you're a graduate medic um I could, like myself but far far more qualified um where did you train then as a graduate so I trained at, at Nottingham at Nottingham um, okay. I, yeah and what did you do before so I have a theology degree. So I have had a bit of a circuitous route into medicine. I did a degree in theology um, and I've had a, a couple of jobs. You know, I used to work as a bank cashier. I used to run the office of the CEO for Boots, which is nowhere near as impressive as it sounds. It does um, sound quite impressive. <laughs> it sounds impressive, but it's not. It's really not. I was admin, <laughs> um, but it does sound good. Um, so I had a couple of jobs. I'd done a degree in theology, which obviously qualified me to do the graduate program yes yeah i graduated in 2011 and my son was born in 2012 yeah and i started medical school in 2013 okay and was was that four years so it would have been 2017 it was four years but i took a year out in the okay. middle um because i felt like i wasn't spending enough time with my son so i took yeah. some time out and we had a lovely year together well, okay that i that's really important, I think, to discuss because people, the questions that I, I get invariably sent from um, from viewers and things a lot, obviously something I don't have any direct experience with. So how, how, how did you find that process of, you know, approaching the medical school, I assume, and saying, actually, I need to take time out, you know, was that, were they okay about that? Um, so I'd had some quiet extreme circumstances in medical school um my dad had got really poorly he'd been diagnosed with terminal cancer and he he got very unwell and he died at the same time i um separated from my son's father right and um we actually didn't have anywhere to live it was a very 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 tumultuous time for both for both, for both george and i yeah and all the while I was going through medical scores in my first year of medical school and I I did really well I kind of just got on with it and I you know one day at a time and I managed to get through but by the time I got into the third year of medical school I had sort of an ongoing custody battle it had been going on for a few years and I just reached a point of complete sort of a burnout yeah, really yeah, yeah. and um in terms of approaching the medical school, I've reached a point where it sort of, it had to be done. So yeah. they were actually very receptive to that because they, they understood that there were more than kind of one sort of reason, which would mean that I needed to take this time. Yeah. And actually, I think that medical schools, as long as you, as long as you sit down and talk to them about what's going on, um, I think they're quite receptive to yeah. making, making, adjustments for you sure. I think it's better for them to support you and keep you as a student than for you to burn out and drop out yeah so they were very receptive to that actually and they they let me go out and come back in and I did I, I don't think I received much support in terms of kind of transitioning back in or I don't think I received much support over that period of kind of absence yeah 
I would like to, in, in retrospect, I think it would have been helpful to have like clinical skills practice periodically. Yeah, ongoing. Yeah, just and kind of stay in touch kind of things. One of the things that they, they do say is that students who lose contact with their cohort struggle to graduate because one of the things that keeps us sort of knitted together is our cohort and pushing each other through. Mm. So the second you slip out of your cohort, um, you're vulnerable. And that's definitely something to be aware of. Um, so it would have been nice if there was some support for that, um, yeah. which there wasn't. But in terms of being able to take the time, they were really supportive. Okay, okay. I mean, it's good to hear again. I think, you know, certainly when I was thinking about coming to medical school or when I was talking to people, it's stories like that that I feel we don't, you don't get exposed to kind of wisdom like that, which... I think a lot of people have, if they are, if they are parents already, or they have significant responsibility, it, um, as I'm sure, obviously, you know, a lot of people perceive it as a real barrier, barrier to entry. And, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be a doctor because I've got these other things to deal with. Um, but actually speaking to people like you and um, to people on my course that have done this, there are ways, obviously, that people, people manage to make it work however difficult it may be in the interim. I definitely think that as graduate students, we are more susceptible to life events. So I know a couple of people whose parents have died during medical school because obviously the majority of people are slightly older. So yeah. they're kind of more, you know, their parents might be older or people have ill health or have, they have children. So I think as, a, as graduates, we're more susceptible to life events, which makes studying at the level of graduate entry medicine quite, quite difficult. Mm. But life happens to everyone. Um, and I think the way medical schools are sometimes is a reflection of how medicine is as a profession, in that we, you know, we remember the days of 100 hour working weeks, and either you're there 100 hours, or you're not there at all. And there's no kind of middle ground for people who are you know struggling um I definitely know people who've got mental health problems who have struggled with um coping with being a junior doctor I think that's definitely more um again like that for, for parents I think that's definitely something that's that's harder um but I think the profession is changing and actually mm. is good news um but we need to see that reflected in the medical schools as well yeah Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, well, we can talk about this. Um, speaking of the profession, it leads us nicely into talking about surgery because you are an aspiring, um, an aspiring surgeon. So let's talk a bit about surgery, women in surgery, becoming a surgeon. It's one of those things that people are um, always interested in. So I guess firstly, when slash how did you decide that you wanted to be a surgeon? Um, it was a process. So when I graduated from medical school, I couldn't have told you what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, I had a really good lecture in which the um, professor had said, if you're thinking about choosing a career, don't think about what you want to do. Think about what you don't want to do and kind of work from there. And work back. So yeah. I, there were things that I knew that weren't for me, like GP, pediatrics, you know, those things diabetes you know there were things that I knew weren't fit if I can interrupt you very briefly um saying that you didn't want to do peds that surprises me because obviously parents tend to have that fr fr from the experience that I've got the parents that I know on the course tend to have that sort of nurturing instinct that makes them they suit pediatrics whether or not they want to do it is there any particular yeah. reason why you don't want to do peds Absolutely. So when I was in my fourth year, I did an SSM. I don't know if, if that's done the world across. It's a special study module. Yes. Sometime. And I did pediatric intensive care because I thought I wanted to do peds too. Um, and I spent, I can't remember, six or eight weeks um, in pediatric intensive care. And there was a little boy there who was the same age as my little boy. And he has a he has a very or had a very very nasty cancer. He was kept, you know, um, constantly ventilated so he wasn't conscious, and it was just too hard. I just yeah. couldn't do it. And the consultant said to me, you know, when 
when things like this happen, you're supposed to be wrecked by it. You know, you shouldn't be able to look at this patient and not feel anything because that's what makes us human. That's what mm. makes us good doctors. But actually, I just, you've got to be very strong. Um, and when I looked at this little boy, all I saw was mine. Yeah. And as, as doctors, you know, there is a degree of you need to have you need to be somewhat fickle sometimes with your emotions because you have to be able to make objective decisions. Obviously, none of us can ever be objective. We're always subjective. But of course. I just felt like I couldn't, I couldn't distance myself from my child and this child. Um, and yeah, it just, it, it's not for me. I can't. Wow. All power to them. They're amazing people. But um no. Uh, pediatric surgery really interests me because the, the pathology is fascinating and then I just think to myself the stakes are so high mm. you can't ever lose as doctors sometimes we lose sometimes you lose a patient who you don't want to lose you know um and if if you know you've got an adult you know they've got a really advanced cancer or you know whatever it is it's easier to deal with than thinking I lost and I shouldn't have lost and because of it, you know, this child and this family is, is ruined. I just, I can't, I can't do it. No, fair um, enough. So I, I, no reason. That's a good reason. Um, that's, that's a very well thought out and um, obviously direct experience um, reason. So, so you, you've ruled out this, this collection of things you don't want to do, but surgery has remained somehow in there um so what yeah, next? many things many things have remained in there unfortunately so um i'm i'm really good at medicine i'm really good at di um, like diagnostic kind of diagnosis is, is is my strength i'm really really good at medicine i'm not good at surgery <laughs> anatomy uh -huh. has never been my forte and the oscies i struggled with the most uh, in finals were surgical ones I think I, I think I felt most of the surgical ones actually. Okay. Um, so okay. when I when I turned up on my first day as an F1 in my cardiac surgery job, um, I was actually I didn't know whether I wanted to do a medical speciality or a surgical speciality, probably leaning more towards medicine. And then I went to work on my cardiac surgery ward, um, which will forever be my spiritual home. I, I love that ward, um, and I. I think I'm a bit of an instant gratification person. Mm. So the thing with cardiac surgery is you'll get a person who's relatively young, say, you know, mid sixties, plays golf two years ago, you know, they were walking four miles a day and now they've got aortic stenosis and their quality of life is just gone. You know, they're breathless, they've got chest pain. And then they come in for a valve replacement. And then like three weeks later, you see this person in clinic and they, they've, like a, it's like a new person like you fix them you've made them you've given them their life back and they get to sort of they can tell you that, that now they're working up to working walking you know three miles a day again they're playing golf again and you know you see the color in their cheeks and there's something that's so rewarding about doing that so I started to think oh I, you know I'm I'm, I'm definitely a, a, an instant gratification person and I thought yeah. I, I really like this um and in medical school I had never loved surgery because I think we, we sort of stand at the back and it's really boring and all, all you've got, you've got like a tiny little screen and you can't see anything apart from bowel and you can't work out which way's up and which yeah, way's down. Yeah, where you are. <laughs> like it's really, it's really badly taught or you get to hold, you know, you get to hold something and you, you just stand there and it's really boring. Um, so medical school never kind of really did anything for me for surgery. But then on cardiac surgery, I went into theatre and there was this um registrar who's about my age she's she went obviously straight through so she's a couple of years older than me but not much and just this tiny little woman and I saw her um kind of do a stenotomy so she had this bone sore and she was this tiny little woman with this <laughs> massive power sore of cracking this you know this was a big guy's chest like you know he was he was like in his 60s, he was a really big chap. And there's just this tiny woman that's kind of <laughs> you know, rising through his, his ribs with the saw. And I was like, this is my kind of woman. <laughs> I, love, I love her. I want to be this woman. 
Um, and she did that and um, she assisted the consultant because the consultants in cardiac surgery are very hands-on mm. in terms of the, the surgery that they do. Um, and I just thought, this is for me. This is <laughs> like, I look at this woman, is my heroine. Um, and I, the more time I spent on the wards, the more I realised that kind of a, a, a shorter ward round is for me. I don't want to be on the wards all the time. I love the idea of being kind of in surgery, in clinic, brief ward round. Um, so I kind of in my heart decided I wanted to do surgery. But the problem with surgery is, is it takes a lot from you. It's not like there are in medicine much more friendly specialities towards uh, women and towards uh, mothers specifically. So mm -hmm. I've had a much easier life, I think, um, if I'd done obs and gynae. So I thought about doing obs and gynae because you've got medicine, you've got surgery, um, and it's much, much, much friendlier towards mothers. Lots of people are part-time. There's a great culture. Uh, in Obs and Gynae. Um, but it just wasn't for me. And, you know, I, I, I did, I sat down and had a conversation with my fiance and said, you know, as a family, how do we feel about me pursuing this? Because it's going to mean more hours. It's going to mean I'm here less. And I had to sit and think, you know, how is this going to affect my child? Because he comes first, ultimately. Um, but I want, I didn't work this hard. Yeah, yeah, of course. Medical school to walk away and do something that I don't want to do. Yeah. So, you know, I felt like I owed it to him as much as to myself to show him what it's like to have a parent working and striving for something and doing something that they love. I want to say to him every day, go out and work hard at school so that one day you can do a job that you love. You know, I wanted to inspire and motivate him. Amazing. And uh, the jury's still out as to whether I've done that. Um, <laughs> But, but we'll see. Um, but the thing with surgery is, is that I think being a parent in surgery is fine if you're not a graduate medic. So if I were, if I had gone to medical school at 18 mm. and not had a child, I'm, I'm 32 now. So I would, I would probably be almost a consultant. So we're having this first baby now you know, my hours wouldn't be terrible. I've already done the hard work. I've done the registrar years. I've done the, you know, all of the projects and the, all of the things that you need to do, the courses, the surgery. Yeah. And I'm almost able to kind of take a step back as a consultant mm. almost and, and, you know, take that time out for, for the child. But when you're a graduate, you're having to do those foundation years as a parent. You're having to do your registrar years as a parent. And I think that makes it much, much, much more difficult. So this year, um, obviously I'm taking a year out because I'm about to have a baby, but this year I've used a lot of my holiday to do courses. Hmm. I recently qualified as an ILS instructor. That was all done in my own time. Well so done. I use, thank you. But um, I have had to use annual leave to do kind of do those days. I've used annual leave for lots of different teaching things. And because with core surgical training, it's very, very competitive. And there often are one point between you not getting a job and you getting a job. So everyone is working really hard and there are no allowances as a parent. You have to just be as good as everyone else. Um, better probably because you need to stay in one location as a parent i don't just need a core surgical job i need a core surgical job that's here so that means that i have to balance being a parent and being a good present parent because that's the most important thing to me mm -hmm. working full-time as a as the foundation doctor and doing all the stuff that i need to do for core surgical training so that's publications that's audits that's courses i mean you know these courses that you know that i'm doing are costing six or seven hundred pounds and they're often over two days which means that you have to stay there you have to pay for your travel and when you're i think when you're a single person that money is it's easier to take um but every penny that i take for these courses which i, I get points for in my application mm. every penny i'm taking from my family that's a holiday, you know, that we could have really in a thousand pounds. We could do something yeah. with that. Um, so being a parent and wanting to be a surgeon 
is constantly about balancing the beast that is surgery that constantly needs feeding and your lotus to your family and they always have to come first you know my son always has to come first um and actually i would say as a foundation doctor the hours haven't been too bad as a parent i have to say for the most part um when I was on cardiac surgery, the hours were manageable. I was doing a 50 hour week every week with on calls on top. Wasn't too bad. Hematology was terrible because that's when I was doing these 70 hour weeks and I felt like I, I didn't get to see my son at all. But you know, it's only for four months. And then I went on to child psychiatry, which was nine to five Monday to Friday with only two weekend on calls in four months. It's wow. fine, completely fine. Hobbs and Guyani was less hours than anything I've done apart from child psych, community Jerry's was community. So actually, if you are a working parent anyway, and you work 37.5, we're not, we're not a million sort of miles away on most weeks from where you are. So in terms of working as the junior doctor and being a parent, that aspect of it is not totally terrible. It's, my, it's doable. It's Good manageable. <laughs> um amazing so um i guess just to round round things out we've covered an awful lot of ground actually i'm going to sneak another question in first which is i didn't ask you i kind of assumed based on what you said but i could be wrong um what type of surgery if you happen to know do you want to do i don't know mm. i just don't know i can't decide because i I love all surgery so much. So I've kind of ruled out neurosurgery. Okay. Um, though I did drill a burr hole in someone's head once and it was really, really cool. Um, <laughs> I've ruled out neurosurgery because the, the hours are just too much. Yeah. It, it would take too much from, from my family. So I've ruled that out. I would love to do cardiac surgery, um, but it's so competitive. I think there was one job, there is one job at st1 in the midlands um every year yeah i, I um, believe for the, for the benefit again of those that all the pre-meds and meds listening at home i i think it's fair to say that cardiac surgery is, is probably the most competitive medical specialty like yeah. year on year on year yeah there are some uh, there are some obscure things i think um Genito, I think gum is really competitive. There are a yeah. couple of things out there, but the competitive ratio for um, cardiothoracics is eight to one. Yeah. Um, and to compare that, neurosurgery is four to one. Yeah. So I know your yeah. odds for getting into med school are much, much bigger than that. Yeah. But you have to think that every single one of those competitors is at your level. They are, you know, they're all kind of at you. So I don't doubt that I could get into cardiothoracics um, if I were to put my mind to it and I was, you know, happy to spend four or five years doing, you know, a PhD or publishing and things like that. But the cost is just too great um, to spend those years when actually I, I think I'd be happy doing other things. So I think, so I'm trying to do my rule out thing um, and I've ruled out sort of urology, but I think probably maybe plastics oh um, but also very competitive so you know it's still a process so I've got core surgical training to kind of make my decision and we'll go from there amazing um so then last last question for you um I'm not going to delve into COVID because I think we'd be here forever um but uh just one one bit of advice maybe that you would give to maybe people in a similar situation to you trying to navigate med school, life as a junior doctor, one golden piece of advice that you recommend everyone try and follow in a similar place? Uh, if they want to, if they're a parent or if they want to do surgery? Both, or both. I guess. <laughs> okay, so I think, um, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to give you two, I think. That's fine. Two very I asked two questions, things. yeah. <laughs> In terms of being a parent, um, 
I always try to be super, super organized and stay ahead of the curve at all times because you're going to drop the ball probably at some point because your child's going to be ill and you're going to have to be off or they're going to be unwell and you're not going to sleep when everyone else is. So I would always try and stay a step, of, a step ahead and in terms of work and workload so that inevitably if my son got poorly or something happened, then I can afford to take a step back without constant you know without constantly worrying how that would affect me um and you know be easy on yourself because you're dealing with two full-time jobs really in terms of career um this is advice that i myself couldn't follow because i didn't know what i wanted to do but if you want to do surgery or if you want to do something super competitive it's so much easier if you start preparing for that in medical school so the um the deaneries publish person specifications and um, they, they publish their scoring matrix for ST1 application. If you're watching this in medical school, my advice to you is go and download that now and have a look at it. So it will say things like, um, you might get eight points for organizing a course. If you can do that in medical school, when you've got a captive audience and you know the university sponsors lots of courses, that is eight points that you don't have to worry about in foundation. If you start that now and you can check off a couple of those boxes, when you come to applying in November of F2, you're going to be, you know, far ahead of the curve. So if you can do that, especially even if you don't know what you want to do, um, a lot of those things are the same, depending on, you know, across the specialities. Yeah. So organising yeah. a course, getting a publication, if you can get a publication and you get a publication in, you know, geriatrics, but you end up wanting to do, you know, something completely different like TNO, it's still a publication, it still counts. So you wouldn't get points towards, say, commitment speciality, but you would still get points towards having a publication. So just go and download that, have a look and see about, you know, do one a year or two a year or you know, and then when you get to apply, you've got a portfolio that is good to go. And that would be my top tip. Excellent. Well, thank you, Dr. Lauren Chain. It's been really, really interesting to have you on. Thank you for coming to speak to us. Thank you for having me. Um, how can people find you? How can they follow your, obviously you run a YouTube channel um, as well. How can people find you online? Um, so I'm at The Surgical Doctor on YouTube and on Instagram. Great. Okay, links to everything will be um, both kind of embedded into this video in the description. Um, you'll be able to find Lauren Jane's stuff. Well, thank you very much. Take care, and I hope to speak to you again soon. Thanks, Ollie. <laughs> Bye.